Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Another podcast of Art Matcher. Joining us today from uh, Alabama, is that correct? Yes, Alabama. <laughs> Alabama, Morgan Eccles. Morgan, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I am 30 years old, almost 31. I started my art journey really seriously about four years ago. I've kind of been into art, you know, in and out of different mediums my whole life. And it wasn't until about four years ago, I think around 2019, that I found my style. Um, before that, I have a degree in psychology from the University of Alabama. I never even considered doing art full time as an option, but it was just one of those things. Once I started and I found what I like to do, I couldn't stop and everything came second. So my job, moving to jobs, trying to find something that made me happy, none of it was comparable to just being in my studio by myself painting. So um, I was able to quit my job and start doing my art full time about a little over a year ago. And a lot of how I've gotten to where I am now has been social media, which is kind of surprising because I've never considered myself like, you know, savvy with social media. I was terrified of TikTok before I got it, but I, I got it just to start posting my uh, process with my artwork. And over time and just being kind of natural with it and just posting the way I would for friends or family, which is how it started, I grew a following that has allowed me to, you know, have these eyes on my work so that I can do it full time. And it's been amazing. Did your, so you said 2019. So 2019 was the start of COVID. Uh, did you start during COVID? I, I started before COVID, but I remember when we, when COVID hit, I, I was so happy because everybody was being sent home and I was just praying I would be one of them. And I had to quarantine at one point from my job for like 10 days. And it was like the best 10 days of my life because I didn't have to leave my apartment. I could just stay there and paint. And I got kind of a taste of what that would be like. And I just, I knew that I, I had to make that happen somehow. And it was probably about four or five months after that, that I was able to finally quit my job. You find, and, and just so the audience knows, your work is very technical. <laughs> in terms of it, it takes a certain steady hand. And I've seen some of the videos where I'm like, wow, she's like, she's kind of going in there with the hand. You find that people just, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have the patience. Or tell us a little bit about your process. Because I know there, there must have been a couple of times you've messed up and you're like, what do you oh. do? <laughs> when oh. that happens? One of the biggest comments I get is I would never have the patience for this. Or if only I had the patience. And it doesn't feel like patience for me. It feels like, I, I mean, if it did feel like I was being patient and I was waiting for the end result, I wouldn't be enjoying it. And the whole reason I do it is because being completely immersed in that process and the longer it takes, the better, you know, it gets me into it further. And for me, it just, everything just disappears when I'm working on those, especially circles, because it is so all-encompassing you have to be very focused on that line work because I don't use tape or anything for my circles and of course at first it was a lot of concentration and almost nervousness because I'm like oh, don't mess up how am I gonna and a lot of touching up when I did mess up and now I've gotten to the point where I I don't have to think about it which I love I can just load up my paintbrush and just go in with those circles. I know exactly how to do it. And of course I still mess up and I love sharing when I mess up, like on my social media, people really appreciate seeing that because it definitely happens. Um, one of the ways I've learned, I don't know, I've got all these cups on my desk that I save every single color that I use. So no matter how big the painting is, I'm mixing every single color I'm using and I'm saving a little bit of it because 
I'll drop my paintbrush and it rolls down everything I've already painted. Wow. Or just, you know, anything like that. It just happens. You know, you can't really help it's, it. Your, your work, there's, there's not much room for error, really, in terms of, like, if there's a mistake, someone's going to, like, that looks like a mistake or that, like, that yes. seems intentional. Yes. Uh, uh, the way that I see it is... Not that intentional, I should say. I, I still see not necessarily mistakes, but when you're doing something freehand, it's not going to be mathematically 100% accurate. So even with my circles where there are discrepancies, it's balanced throughout the entire painting. So maybe when one, one circle might be so ever so slightly thinner and then thicker right next to it, on the other side of the painting somewhere, it's going to look the same way. So that level of balance is there so that even when you, if you do see a mistake or you think you do, it's so balanced that you just don't even see it. You're consistent oh. with the inconsistencies of it. Yeah. No, Not that, intentionally. It's just, you know, a natural element of being a human painting circles. <laughs> do people, then, then you must get this all the time where people go, oh my gosh, did you paint that then? Is that a painting? Yes. People think I do um, digital work until they see that I have painted it, you know, completely with my hands. Um, I, I am so ignorant with digital artwork. I can't even use an iPad to sketch something that I might want to paint, like a mock-up or something. I, I have no idea how to do that. I couldn't even begin to, and honestly have no interest in it either. I just see it in my head, and sometimes I'll kind of draw it on a piece of paper to see how the shapes might fit with themselves. But most of the time, I just go straight to the canvas with what's in my head. Yeah, because I, I think it's interesting. I think the respect goes up. I think there's this thing when and I'm not sure if it should or if it shouldn't in that sense of like, even if these were digitally created, cause it does like, so let, let's, do you have a background in color theory or anything? I know you said you, you studied psychology, but you must have a kind of grasp on understanding colors, especially looking at your work. So I do. And I, I, um, I think I know how I got there, but that's another comment I get all the time, especially if something really goes viral is, your color theory teacher must be so happy or you <laughs> aced color theory. And when I first started getting the, those comments, I honestly didn't know what color theory was. I've wow. never studied it. I've never really taken any formal art classes. So I, I researched it just to see what it was. Um, but most of my understanding of color, I think there's a natural instinct with some people have this, you know, these two colors look good together and you know that. And it's taking that where you start, where I started, and evolving that. And some of the first paintings that I did, I would take a geometric shape of some kind that might have, have these spaces blocked out, maybe 200 of them, and I would not repeat any two colors twice. So I would individually mix an, a color for every single section. So that taught me how the colors interact with each other when you mix them together. I would mix one with another and take that one and mix it with this one and just keep going down the line to create all these colors. So eventually you learn how to mix them to get the desired color that you want. And as far as color combinations, as far as that goes in color theory, I just, I can't really explain it. I just know what I like. And I get most of my ideas through colors. I get the idea for two or three colors that I want to see together and then the rest of the design is just meant to showcase the colors. Because, I mean, I look, I mean, it's, it's interesting looking at the bodies of work that I've seen of yours. And so actually, I'm going to ask you this. Your pro, like, can you kind of take us through your process, your initial, what was the first, it was the first initial shape, uh, a circle, was it a square? Was it just kind of one of those gradients? What, what was the first, if you, if you remember it? The first thing I did was actually, I called them like tubes. They were like, you'd have straight lines followed by like a curve, and then they would just kind of float around the canvas. And I remember tracing out the curves with like cups and lids for pots and pans and stuff like that because they didn't have any tools. So I would trace out the curves. And following that was more geometric type of stuff, very straight lines intersecting, and that's where I would kind of fill in the colors. 
It took me a while to get into circles because they were so difficult. I knew that I wanted to do them. So I did several works that were, you know, kind of playing with circles, but they never turned out how I wanted them to. They always looked messier than obviously a straight line would when you're using tape. So it didn't work, but I eventually, and I think it really took off when I did quit my job. One of the first paintings I did was a single concentric circle gradient from, it was like blue on the outside, moving into white in the center. So I just had two colors or really just one, the blue and then moving into the white. And I brought it into the center. And it's one of those things I had in my head for probably six months to a year and just couldn't get myself to do it. I, I just knew it wouldn't turn out how I wanted it to. And because the colors are so close to the, to each other, as far as the gradient, the mistakes are, aren't as obvious. So it looks so much cleaner. So then when I took that and moved into alternating gradients where you have sharp contrast between each circle, that's where it has to really be technically better. So that came later. Um, but once I got into circles and kind of mastered it, the process and feeling so comfortable with it and knowing that I can achieve what I'm setting out to, it just stuck. I love it because I, I it's just the freehand nature of it. Yeah, that would drive me nuts because I just think like I'm kind of assuming your process starts with like a, a protractor. Yeah, it's it's uh, a lot like a Tremel compass. Oh, where you put a dot in the center and then you go around it. Got it. Yeah, exactly. So I make these, I measure out, there's different, you know, spacing between each one. This is for a pretty big canvas, but um, it's basically a strip of paper and I've got videos on my page on like how to make them. I've seen a lot of people use them before. It's not anything I invented, but I just kind of came up with it because it solved a problem for me. Because like I said, before I figured that out, I was using candles and lampshades and everything circular around my house to trace circles. <laughs> and do you, so do you feel comfortable? So what I find fascinating about kind of your artistic career, you didn't come into it kind of later because you're, you're very young in this space, but do you find that like sharing your career? Cause I know coming from an art background, a lot of artists, when they have their secrets, they kind of keep it to themselves and they don't want to share it. So how do you feel about that? Especially knowing that your process, there is like, there is a science to it. And I think one of the things that I have so much respect for it is because you know, there's just like, that's patience. That's like, mm -hmm. oh, person has patience to do that type of work. So how do you feel about sharing your process for one and kind of, yeah, I guess let's start there. <laughs> I guess for me, I've never felt guarded with how I work. For me, when I share my process, I feel like that's sharing the artwork itself because the process for me is the whole thing. That's what it's all about. I'm so committed and, you know, it just takes over my world when I'm working on a painting. And when it's done, it's like, okay, that's great. That looks, who wants it? You know, like, let's move on. What's the next one? I'm ready for the next one. So when it's done, it's wonderful. It's satisfying. But the whole point of why I do it isn't for the end result. It's for the process of it. So sharing the process just feels to me like sharing the end result. You know, it just kind of feels the same because of what I put into it. But as far as sharing those techniques, I've kind of always done that. And I've had a lot of people because of that try to duplicate my work and take those techniques and make them their own. I've never had a problem with it. And in a lot of ways, it kind of makes me feel good because I know how long it took me to make the result that I do. I know how much work and how many hours and how many paintings came before to get to the one. So when somebody who's just interested in the style or even thinks it looks easy, tries it, for one, they see it's not so easy. And it, it just kind of reminds me that I have come a long way because my first paintings looked like that too. You know, it's just, it takes that level of commitment that's just absurd to want to be able to paint the circle so perfectly that you stick with it to get to the point where I am now. 
And I, I, I think so. Do people, because the kind of the audience that you've been playing to kind of like it's a world audience, like, do you find people like duet stuff in, in your style in a way? Like, are they mimicking your palette or like what? Ex- all, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Yeah. I'm looking at, at, the, at the painting behind you and I go, wow, that that's a combination of a circle meets the star. So which one is done first? Is it the star and then the circle or are they um, simultaneously? So when I first start my draft, I put out all of my circles and then I put in my star where I want it. And at, for every circle painting that I'm doing, I start on the outside and work my way in. So I started on the very outside and then kept working it into like the very corner of the star and I saved every one of those colors. And then I went back and taped up all those the circles and then started the star with the same colors in reverse. So at that point, it's kind of like a sigh of relief because I've already got the colors mixed up perfectly. So then I just duplicate that on the, on the star. And you see the star, but I'm not actually painting a star. I'm just painting circles even within the star. And the, you know, the cross section of the star the lines just gives you the star, but really it's just all circles. So, I'm, yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, I think, so you're, you're, let's, let's talk about your work right now, kind of where you're moving into, because you, you've grown exponentially in these couple of years. I mean, technically, especially you seem, and as we talked in our prior conversation, that you kind of like hammer out, like when you're in the zone, you're in the zone, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> So do you find like you're at a point like what's the next steps of kind of building on your career? Are you going into like different shapes or do they have significance? Like, is there, cause from an outsider looking in, like I can look at your work and just say, Hey, I just aesthetically like what's going on here. And I could leave it there. It doesn't need to be conceptual or if there's a story, but is there like behind some of these works you know, I wish I could say um, that there was, but a lot of it is aesthetic, you know. And for me, the meaning just comes from what I get out of making it. So it's so unique and different for every single one. When I look back at a painting that I made a year ago, I remember exactly what headspace I was in when I was making that. What music I was listening to, what I might have been watching on Netflix, maybe what even I ate for lunch the day that I was at this part in the circle. It's like a record where it just records every part of my life in that moment. So there's a lot that I look back at and I'm like, oh, I was in a bad place when I made that. But I don't necessarily know how much that translates to a viewer. You know, a lot of people will see something and get meaning out of it, which I love, but it's not put in there by me necessarily to say one thing for sure and i think like even like i'm i have the kind of the privilege of looking at some works behind her um i'm looking at like the different shapes and stuff and the different kind of works you have so are you in a space of like okay i'm gonna do like these circles i'm gonna do these blobs i'm gonna do like I'm assuming you're working in series because like I'm looking at a green one right now and I'm looking at a blue one. They're both in the same vein um, compositionally, color wise, they're, they're similar. They're both cool palettes. Like, are you working in series? Do you look at the work individually? I mean, I'm very curious what you're listening to music wise when you're creating these, because <laughs> I'm assuming it's not death metal, but I could be, you know, it's not, me. it's not death metal. <laughs> um, my music taste is basically Bob Moses and Mute Math and everything else that is in that genre. <laughs> okay. So I, I love that. Um, as far as the series work, these are my minis. I do like a series of minis every year. Um, these are some of my favorites that just, the reason I do them, I, I kind of get out all of my ideas on pieces of paper. These are nine by 12 watercolor papers with just acrylic paint. So I just kind of turn out all these ideas and once I'm done with them, I can look back and pick out these ones that I want to put on a canvas. It really allows me to be creative in a different way because there's less of a commitment. I can play with colors a lot more freely as if I don't already, but you know, I can experiment more. And out of those comes a lot of the bigger ideas. 
Um, so some of these, the blobs that you see, that's something that I want to put on canvas is almost the next step to the circles where you're still seeing the same color patterns, the way they play with each other, but you see a different shape. So as I work through each one, it's how, I'm, how can I get this technique just right, where I love the way it looks just right. Because when I started these, I didn't even know what they would look like when they were done. I didn't expect them to be blobs or have any kind of an illusion exactly. It was almost like I was just taking the circle idea and warping it. And so that's what I did and I really loved the results. So um, a lot of these minis are for that purpose, for- Those are the ideas before yeah. the canvas. Mm -hmm. Inspire and the next thing. Did you jump to the conclusion to work on canvas first versus a flatter surface like board? Because I would find that like, when you're going over a line, right, and you have a nice, uh, the opacity on the brush hitting the canvas, and I'm sure you've encountered this, um, where it's all nice and clean, and then you get that nice little white dot. That oh, yeah. Paint, and then you got to go back in there. So on a board, you wouldn't have that problem. So I'm kind of fascinated that, and I was just looking at a photo of one of her works uh, before we jumped on here um you know you could see the tooth of the canvas so you're not going like too many layers to the point some artists they like liberate they want a smooth surface so tell me kind of how you got into maybe acrylic on kind of the the medium you're working especially with your type of work um so i I love that you mentioned the white dots because I've never heard anybody else talk about them. They drive me insane. And I'm sure any other artist on canvas, um, the amount of time I have spent with the fine brush filling in those dots that maybe nobody would notice, but I know they are there. I do. I know that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I, the point of my work is that it is just as precise and beautiful when you're this an inch away from it as far away. You know, I want you to be able to put your face in it and still see all of the work and precision that's gone into it. Um, I have just fallen in love with the texture of a canvas, as frustrating as it can be in some ways. I just love the way that it feels under my brush. And I've tried painting on wood before and I, you know, I paint on paper sometimes, but I really got to tell you, I hated painting on wood. I did not enjoy it. It was not what I expected. Uh, it just absorbs the paint so quickly, no matter how many layers of gesso you've put on it. It's just a different kind of surface. It just takes in the paint so quickly. And it just wasn't as fun. And the lines might have been clean, maybe even cleaner. But yeah, I just, it's something about the canvas, the way that it, it, moves and you know kind of reacts with with you and the texture of it under the brush and it wears down my brushes just I, I paint with the angle brushes and they are just all the way to the metal on one wow. end oh, like and it doesn't take me long to get to that point either they just wear down so quickly the way I use them but I just love it I don't know why I love the canvas I kind of started with the canvas um, once again kind of like your your imagery and your process that's not forgiving for error. I mean, there could be like, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the artist who, um, I think his name's Column or something. He's like from Canada and he like, he's, he's yes. using this contraption. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm going to pay the compliment that you have your like, your, uh, your strategy of how you tackle these things. And, you know, I know about the kind of when the canvas doesn't absorb that little area and you're, cause your hand, when you're moving, I mean, I'm assuming you can't like, I'm just envisioning the stroke has to be like consistent. You can't just like, you know, be jerking around. Otherwise you're going to see that it's, it's going to be very evident. And so I, when I look at your work, it, it, I just go, wow, patience, and it gives me a little bit of anxiety to a certain extent. I'm sure. <laughs> You're so calm and collective with it, and it's, I guess it must be therapy for you then. It like, is. 
It is. No matter what's going on, um, everything just disappears. When I'm in my little studio, just the world shuts off and I'm, it's just me and whatever I'm working on. Do you find yourself with your works, like, because I'm assuming when you layer images, that creates a more difficult level in the work. So I'm looking, going back to the one with, like, let's say, the circle and the star, layering that image is much more complicated if you're just doing a circle, correct? Yeah, it is. One of the um, biggest parts is lining up the, the two circles where they meet under the tape. Because once you've taped it off, you're, the circle is continuing straight, but there's a disruption in the color. And when it's under the tape, you can't see where those two lines meet each other. So uh -huh. there's a level of trust in your line. So, you know, I'll go over it with the pencil over the, over the tape. But then again, where I painted over that same pencil line under the tape, I could have gone slightly over it or, you know, just met it right on. So there's that extra level of trusting my process and that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I Are you painting over the tape when you're like making your journey to that part where that, that doesn't have tape? Cause now, now I'm getting a sense of a little bit of the process. So you said you had worked from the background, uh, from kind of the, the end to the, to the center. Mm -hmm. So when you're working there, that star is completely taped off. Yes. Do you use, just this is an interesting secret uh, from the art world, do you use matte medium? Yes. You do use matte medium. So you use matte medium for the barrier, to create a barrier between the tape and the canvas. Yes, I do. Yeah, I'm not your average kind of art dealer or art person, so I know a little bit of tricks of the trade. I, my background is like, I used to teach people how to create that perfect line with painter's tape, and people would come... Mm -hmm and see some of the works I've done, and they're like, how did you get that line? And I'm like, oh, there's a couple of secrets of how you can get a line pretty straight. Yeah. Wow, then that is, that's a hefty process. Because what I found over the time, there's sometimes you could do two, three layers of matte medium, and for some reason, if there's a run-through, mm -hmm. I'm sure at this point you're probably like a veteran, there's no run-throughs, but um, wow, that's, that's very fascinating. That's, wow, that's, that's a lot of work. So I think on this painting, I might have had one or two run-through spots. Maybe one. Forward, so. But the hardest part is, you know, acrylic paint dries darker than it is wet. So when I've got all of my color saved, I've got to find that same color to touch up where it's bled through. And it looks, you have to know how it's going to look dry to try and get the right one. At what stage, yeah. So do you put like a little sampler on your on the cases you do keep. Um, and here's, an, here's another thing. We're getting into the, the conversation where I guess for the fans there that know a little bit about process, do you find the, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the density of the, the paint needs to be, it can't be too thick, can't be too thin. You found your, your secrets off of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's the Liquitex heavy body can be too thick. I love that paint. The color payoff, the opacity is brilliant. That's one of the, probably the brands I have the most of, but some of them, and it's so inconsistent. There are certain colors where you're going to get, it's going to be too thick and it can't be too thick because you've got to get it to run perfectly into that circle over that line. Because if it's too, if it doesn't run into the grooves, you're going to get these tiny little jumps where you see the texture of the canvas on those lines. So um, I do have like a slow dry mixing medium if I just have to use that color where I can kind of thin it out a little bit. Um, have you ever tried these in oil by any chance? Not really. I, I've done like one thing, but I, I kind of did it in my own style. I didn't take advantage of what it's actually meant to be used for, and I didn't have any of the proper other tools. So I did not actually give it a fair chance. <laughs> didn't give it a fair chance. Because I, I would assume there's there's a balance between kind of the speed where you can't work too fast, but you can't work too slow. Either you need this to dry, otherwise the layers would take, you'd be working potentially months in oil on this. Oh, yeah. That's why I love acrylic is how fast it dries. And it's 
especially when I am doing circles because I'm rotating the canvas. So where I start with one of my layers, by the time I reach that point again, it's dry. already dry and I can keep going. And with my arm, I always paint on the left side of my canvas. So I'm, cause it just, that's the way your wrist moves in a circle. It just, it's helpful. So I'm, putting my arm over where it's, you know, the circles already kind of passed through and you, I, I kind of know second nature at what point that's going to be dry enough to just have my hand right on it and it not disrupt the paint in any way. Are you wearing gloves too? Like the graphite ever smearing or do you put something down on the, are you work? Oh, here's an interesting, are you working down on like a table or are you working on an easel upright? I'm working on a, um, a drafting table. Drafting. So yeah, it'll, it'll come up to meet me where I want it to. When I first put my sketch down, I put a white gesso on top of all the pencil. So it still shows through, but it's not going to smudge or anything. And when I'm actually putting each individual circle, um, once I painted over that line and I'm ready for the next color, I go and reinstate that line again. And, um, I, I've never had a, any problem with it bleeding through maybe on the first layer, but once you've put three or four layers, it's, you won't see it. Let's talk about the works you sent me and kind of this body of work that you had been working on in terms of like kind of thinking in an exhibition space. I know kind of prior this meeting, whether you were thinking this way or not, this is kind of one of the things that I kind of somewhat encouraged maybe um, to work towards. And kind of looking, one of the works that kind of fascinates me, I, I'm just going to call it the, the pizza one, the one with the green, the, the slices. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a work like that, um, and, and we'll, we'll have uh, images of these so people can look at your work. Like, are you looking at that shape? And it goes back, like, is that in a series? Is that a single, like... That was, did you do a sketch for that one to start? Or were you like, like, how do you come up with? Yeah, I, I did. I remember doing a sketch and what that basically looked like was drawing a single circle on a piece of paper and then dividing it up in some ways. And I remember playing with it a little bit, wondering if I wanted to do almost like an hourglass where I just had like the two on the top and bottom. And I was, I, I was cautious of it not looking like a like a pizza in slices, but I understand why you call it that because I, I call it the same thing. <laughs> um, but I landed on that and just, I wanted the colors to be- I love pizza, by the way. That's why, like, that's like my favorite food. So oh, was, yeah. You was, can't. Was, <laughs> seen that one. <laughs> and I wanted the colors to be complementary but different on each side. And you'll notice they both fade into the same color in the very center. So they meet back together in, in the very center of that painting. Yeah, no, I, I see that. And like, so these colors, like, do you test them before? Like, be, like do you, you must run into problems. Do you, have you ever just run out of a color or are you? Yeah. Um, it, it's it, not it, the color straight out of the tube, I'm assuming, right? No, no, no. Um, none of that would be. I, I mix all of my colors See, I'll mix, like, say, the background color, the main green, I'll mix, like, a, a fair amount of first. And then I have um, my main colors, which are the ones I'm moving into between. It's where the gradient happens between two colors. So I'll take my first color that I want to start with, say it's, like, the lavender or something, and then I'm moving into, like, a, a blue of some kind. I'll have those two colors mixed ahead of time. And whatever happens in between is like a surprise. It's just like a fun surprise, but I kind of know, you know, what it's going to look like, but cause I know how the colors mix with, with each other. And sometimes I'll test that, but for the most part, I've got my, a couple of main colors that I know I'm moving between. And then I just fill in the space and sometimes I'll stretch it and, and just move it like pretty far. And then sometimes I'll make the jump happen pretty quickly and only like three or four sections to if I want to like keep the color moving. And that's actually one thing that I do that I don't know how I do. It amazes me because for example, I've got these, um, this set that I'm doing of the, the single gradient. This is like the 20 by twenties yeah. um, of different colors each. 
So I start with like the outside color and I have only 14 individual rings so that they're all identical. So whatever the outside color is, I've got to make it move smoothly from the outside to a pure white center without it looking like I'm jumping too quickly between them. So I have to know exactly how to move the color forward enough so that it gets to that point without there being any weird jumps. It has to look even. And that's not like a formula or anything. That's just eyeballing it basically you're dealing with like kind of a lot of uh tints and shades then of like is that are you using one color adding white and black then then or are you actually using a different color there with those um with with like these with these it's just white i'm starting with just the main color and then it's moving into white so and you're then- adding you're mm-hmm. adding white to to it yeah we're starting from dark to light right yes okay yeah and then if i'm doing um moving between colors in a painting itself i'll just it'll be i'll say it's green and blue i'm just taking the my main green and then i'm just adding the blue just slowly adding more and more until i'm just left with the blue itself it's funny to me because i took a color theory class back in college and there's these exercise they they make us do to like that's a certain type of exercise and most of the students want to just kind of push through the exercise like let me get to a point where i get an a in it you you get like an a plus plus and (laughs) multiple colors normally you're trying to go from black to white and you're just doing a gradient do you find do you do any um uh grayscale works because i haven't i haven't seen too many black and white works of yours rarely but there is actually one that i sent you with the hexagons the very center hexagon is grayscale. But rarely do I work in grayscale. And mostly because I find it hard to complement grayscale because I wouldn't want to do um, a painting that's just grayscale by itself, the entire thing. I would want there to be some other colors within it. And I just, I can't find a complement to grayscale that I that sits right with me. Even, you know, just blue, green. I think red is the one I used in that painting because I do feel those go well together. But for the most part, grayscale just, it doesn't spark anything in me with other colors. So I got to ask this, what's your favorite color? (laughs) Um, Probably get asked that a million times. I do, and it's hard to answer, but I think green. Either green or blue, and it's because those colors make the most sense to me as far as mixing goes. I know how to make so many different variations of both of those colors by mixing in all different other sorts of colors. I know just all the levels of that color. And like the opposite of that would be orange. Orange doesn't make any sense to me. I've tried, I've used it before, but as far as mixing it with other colors to get a desired shade, it just doesn't compute. (laughs) Wow, that's amazing. And so like, it's interesting, like when I'm now that I'm looking at some more of your paintings, kind of like the green, are you more gravitated to like a cooler green? Because like, I, I have noticed kind of like this kind of the green behind you, I feel like I've seen, I mean, I've mm-hmm. seen a smaller one. I, I'm, it's now kind of visually, I'm picking up on it a little bit more. Um, I Probably so. Either that or like a very yellow green, almost chartreuse. Um, This one's like Viridian. And this one, I'm not sure if that's the same Viridian or or another one. But um, yeah, I'm pretty much all over the map with greens. But I really love like olive green and Viridian, like both of those sides of the yellow warming and the, um, the cooler toned as well. And, and what was that like, kind of finding the paint that you were like, this is the paint that's going to work? So we mentioned Liquitex. Is that, are you exclusive to Liquitex or you're like, I go to Golden and some other ones? <laughs> I've been really growing towards Golden, honestly. Um, Liquitex, it's been great because when they say it's opaque, it usually really is opaque. Um, of course, there's variations with every color. It's, it's so inconsistent. But I've been leaning towards golden i don't know what it is but they have certain colors that i've kind of moved towards and been like playing with a little bit more and they have a really good consistency 
um, sometimes better than Liquitex. They, they're they're still heavy body, but they're still that like thin enough to really move the way you want it to. Because there's nothing more frustrating than when a, a one of your paints gets thick and you just can't get your line straight. I'd rather just start over with a different color than try and fight with that. Because I shouldn't have to be fighting with my paint is how I see it. It should be doing what I want it to. <laughs> do you have to you you have to add medium to your paints when you're painting? Not usually. Um, only if I have to when a, a paint really just isn't cooperating with me. Um, but for the most part, no. No mediums. Just you're just mixing the paints. It's. I feel kind of when I look at your work. For me, I could just stare in it and like gaze into it for a while. Do you find? Have you gotten to experience people looking at your work, especially kind of having come from like I guess your blow up was through social media, if you will, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So yeah. have, have you gotten to witness of like how people kind of at the, the shows that you have done in person of what that experience is like? Somewhat. Um, but I think the, the times that I have taken my work out in public, I, nobody knew who I was. And I also don't think I was at the level that I am now when I have done those things in the past. So um, I have gotten people that'll come in and just they just their eyes light up, you know, and they when they look at it and they just keep staring at it. And I I love that. For me, when I'm painting, it's it's almost like when you have a, a dream and you try and explain it, you can never get it right. You know, you can't accurately tell somebody what you've dreamed of, no matter how hard you try. But when I paint something, that's what it feels like to me. It's like putting a dream into reality where other people can see it, because it's how I just see it in my head before I start, and I've turned it into something. And the goal is really to make things that you can stare at without figuring out. I don't want it to be like, okay, I've seen enough. I've got it On to the next. It's, I want you to be able to look at it and just take it in and see all that you can out of it and not get bored of it. I couldn't, I could imagine kind of like that, that your paintings come out kind of the way you envision them. A lot of artists, a lot of times I question that due to if I'm dealing with an artist that, I deal with a lot of artists that, um, let's say, do realism mm. based off of a picture or reference. And oftentimes when I'm looking at the reference, I could be like, ah, oh, you know, that arm you did, the foreshortening is not right or something. So do you actually see the images that you paint or do you, is there an element of mystery where you're like, oh, well, that actually came out drastically different than what you envisioned for the most part? I'd say most of the time... Um Well, maybe not most. It's probably 50-50 where they come out exactly as I planned and it was a complete surprise. Uh, especially when it's a bigger painting um, and I'm moving through a lot of different colors. I step back and look at it and it's kind of a surprise. And sometimes those are the most fun when I don't even have a plan. I just know kind of the colors I want to use and I just see what happens because I could be halfway through a painting and I've already completed all the colors that I initially thought I was going to use. And then it becomes something entirely different because what am I, what, when I, what am I going to do now from here to the center? And I'll, you know, pick something else. And I love seeing that come together and almost discovering it for myself. Those are awesome. Wow. So there is a little bit of like kind of shooting by the hip there then. Yeah, definitely. There's probably more of that, honestly, than, than anything else. The only ones that I come into with a really strong plan might be these ones that have extra shapes in them because I, I know exactly what the composition itself is going to look like. But what it really is going to look like in the end, how the colors are going to play and if there's any illusions going to pop out, a lot of that happens by surprise. Because the end result, when I look at your work, looks like this takes a plan you have to stick to the game plan for the most part the ones that are maybe single okay you start off with this kind of shape and you kind of have to follow the shape especially kind of if the method is you're adding a ring every time were you ever kind of inspired by trees like tree trunks and stuff yes i i have done one like that um it was a while ago but i did a a painting a circle painting one of my first ones and the very it was it had very thin black rings and then gradiating colors around between those that was a little thicker bands. And then the very outside was kind of a very rough edge where I 
kind of blocked out for a black background and then changed my mind and said, I like how that looks as it is. And it looked like a cross section of a tree trunk. I thought it was cool. And I actually tried to recreate that at some point later on and um, I couldn't do it. <laughs> wow, yeah. I don't know what I did, but it worked once. Because, yeah, a lot of the works, um, when I'm looking at them, they're very kind of like, they're precise, but they, they're they organic. I mean, the circle is organic in, 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 in nature in that sense. Mm-hmm. Where, where do you see yourself? Like, do you, um, do you think about, like, when you tackle, like, your work now, like, like what's the, the leveling up to it? that you see of like, do you think, is it, does it come from a technical part, especially knowing how much as, as we, as we talk, that process is involved in your work. So is it about kind of maintaining that or do you level it up of like, like challenge yourself? Like how do you, how do you look at that aspect? I I challenge myself. Um, I'll get a new idea and I'll get this kind of, little new idea for something that I haven't done before that I could add to it to elevate it in some way. And sometimes I just beat myself up for those ideas because once I have it, I can't abandon it. I know I have to follow through with that idea and make it happen. But once I've done it once and I have this new skill set for this, you know, whatever I'm adding to, it just snowballs and all these new ideas come. And really that's how my work has progressed from the very beginning. And I don't like doing the same thing twice. I don't like painting the same thing two times, which sounds kind of crazy because I'm painting so many circles, but even there's so many subtle variations, whether it's the thickness of the lines or the colors or the way I'm using the colors, there's something different in every single one. So I have no doubt that in the future, it's just going to keep progressing and I don't know where that's going to go, but it's, it's exciting because I can look back a year and look at what I created here in the last month or so. And I know that for one, I wouldn't have even had the idea for what I've just made, but even if I had, I wouldn't have been able to execute it. So, so the, it's kind of led me up to this point and I feel like it just keeps doing, there's always just stepping forward and doing the next idea for whatever it is. So which work, um, as we close out, uh, almost towards the end here, which work was the most challenging? I mean, te- technically, where you're like, wow, this one really, I was pulling out hairs on this one. Which shape? It, it has to be like, I think it was like a hexagon or something. I think the one that gave me the most trouble was the X. The X? Yeah, and the reason being, I had the idea for the X for such a long time And I can't even tell you how many times I've drawn it on a canvas just to have erased it and done something entirely different. And I don't know why. I just never, I could never get it right. I could never get the shape right, whether it was going to be the rounded edges or it would be like sharp lines at the corners. I could never get the shape just how I wanted to. So I really had to commit with that one and get as close to what I thought was going to be the perfect, you know, execution of that shape. And I think that it, it's been one of the favorites for, you know, the close people in my circle that have seen my works that are all over my house that seems to stand out to them. And so I'm really glad that I pushed and and finally did it. Um, Other than that, the one that I have trouble, I haven't actually done is a heart. A heart. Oh, wow. You haven't done a heart yet? I've never done a heart. And that's another one that I probably put on a canvas so many times and it always ends up looking like something else that I don't want it to look like. It's hard to figure out what is the perfect heart looking. Is yeah. it more rounded? Is it more pointed? I can imagine there, you, you really have to find the one that um, right. speaks to you. And also the, if the geometry, the symmetry needs to work out correctly. Right. I need to be able to do it in a way that it is geometric because if I'm when I'm making all the lines around it inside or outside I have to be able to duplicate it at different sizes so if I'm just cutting out a piece of paper you know and laying that on just to trace a heart that's easy enough the other one that's a mini version that fits exactly yeah that's right but then to duplicate I have to figure out how to do it with my compass and pencil and lines and measurements and I've I've 
really come to and from that shape so many times, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see a heart somewhere in the future. I mean, it's all love. Where can uh, everyone find you? What's the best? What are the best media outlets if you can shout yourself out? Um, so it's pretty easy for me. My TikTok and Instagram handles are the same. It's Morgan underscore Eccles and it's E-C-H-O-L-S. And MorganEcclesArt.com is my website and I do sell prints. Check her out. Check out the prints and stuff. We'll be having a show in the near future. So uh, out here in Los Angeles. So we're going to be excited for that. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, until next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.